you doing? Good. It's nice to have you up here, Matt. Uh, I'm thrilled to be up here. Thrilled. I'm always amazed at you. I'm just, I have to say, I'm, I'm just always amazed when the intermission's over and someone's still here, so it's very nice. <laughs> So I, this is actually the second time I've seen this portion of the talk, yeah. and I, I like the fact I understand a little bit more about it now than I did yesterday. Good. And I understood a little bit more yesterday than I did before that. Uh, but one of the things is that it always reminds me, as I learn more and understand more, I also learn that there's a whole lot more that I don't know. And if this keeps up until I die, I will eventually <laughs> realize that I pretty much know nothing, even though I know something, and that's really frustrating. Uh, because I've improved. My, my understanding's improved. And yet somehow it got worse. But that's great. That's called learning. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's yeah, the less you know, the more you you know, that's the difference between you and Donald Trump. Okay. <laughs> that's the difference. No, well, there's at least one. There's one. There's one. There's, I was trying to think of them. No, there's a, but that's at least one because it's because he doesn't know that he doesn't know, and that's the scariest thing. It is. I, I called him the Dunning Kruger president. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, absolutely. It's very much that. For those of you who don't know, look it up, you'll like love it. Uh, I, I wanted to start with uh, talking about the first time we ever met, because in hindsight, for me, it was probably a little more obnoxious for him than it was for me. We were, it was Imagine a Religion 2 conference in Kamloops, British Columbia, and our flights were supposed to arrive at about the same time, and so they had a limo there waiting. <laughs> And then my flight just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And they made him sit in the airport waiting for this guy who he doesn't know, who he's supposed to share a limo with, and he doesn't get. And I, I, someday you'll have to tell me exactly what's going through your mind. But I finally show up, we get in the car, and so now you have one of the world's eminent scientists and a guy who's probably better versed in philosophy than certainly physics. And what did I do? I'd like to ask you some questions about this idea about a universe from nothing. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm sure you've never heard before. Yeah, never, yeah. a jackass that doesn't know what he's talking about. And luckily it didn't make him hate me. And so here we are. Yeah, no, I, but waiting for you hate me, me hate you. <laughs> oh no, when, when, uh, when, they, when I finally did show up uh, and we got in the car, I was sure that he was going to hate me for the rest of our lives. Yeah, just for the, you know, for the I think I'd flown from Australia so I was a little tired. And, yeah. Yeah, but I used to do that a lot. So. so I thought we'd actually start with that. Tell us about a universe of nothing in uh, 20 seconds. <laughs> Great. To fix us all. Well, um, well, I'll tell you. It's it, there. I'll, I'll tell you one thing that is interesting, at least maybe one thing that in the, when I wrote a universe from nothing, there were speculations I made about the universe that, based on what we thought we knew, that are now much more firmly grounded, which is really neat. And they hate discovery the Higgs field which occurred after that book was written, is an example. Because the fact that empty space can have this field everywhere in it, it demonstrates that empty space is much more interesting than you'd imagine otherwise. And in fact, that kind of field is intimately related to the kind of field that, that explains the, the very beginning of the universe. So the, the supposition that there could be any kind of field in empty space was something we thought might be the case, but we didn't know at that time. So it's nice to know that, that the book is even more right than it was. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's less speculative, let, let's put it that way. And, and the other thing that's probably, because I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm going to be a politician, I'm going to avoid the answer to your specific question, because I'm not going to talk about a universe from nothing a lot, because uh, that would take a lecture, except to say that the universe can come from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans, and that's amazing, and we should love that fact that science has shown us that you don't need God to make a universe, and that's amazing. But one of the other things that was in the book, which, which, which is some things that I've done with debates with some people that you, you, I know you'd you like to debate or would, li would like to debate. I don't care about debating. Yeah, one. yeah, okay. Um, He's yeah, he is beneath you, well beneath you. Um, that they say, a number of theologians often say that we, we created the multiverse because, you know, we don't like God, but it's, it really it's just an excuse for God. And I always say the difference is the multiverse is well motivated. But um, God isn't. But, uh, and the, God, the multiverse might explain something, and God doesn't. But it, but it still sounded metaphysical. But what's really kind of neat is in the interim, because of another great discovery, which I've talked about in other lectures at various times, the discovery of gravitational waves uh, that we just made, gives us a hope of discovering gravitational waves from the Big Bang itself, which would allow us to look back in time back to a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, 
really see the very beginning of the universe and test our ideas and basically be able to indirectly test to see if there are other universes. At the same level as we indirectly knew atoms existed well before we could ever see them. We can basically test all the ideas that make 55 predictions and, and, and test them. And the 56th prediction is, if all these things are true, there must be other universes. And so we, it's really, for me, it's amazing because we'll take this really metaphysical idea and, and, and make it physics. And, I, and that's all happened in the last five years. The, the story gets better. And I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit Good. Uh, from the standpoint of lay people. You're welcome. <laughs> There are, there's this perception from people who don't understand this stuff that what a number of physicists are doing is magic. Or be it. For example, when we talk about um, the photon, it being yeah. massless, that it's roughly the same as embezzlement. Yeah. And when you talk about the universe from nothing and you talk about quantum fluctuations, mm -hmm. as soon as you put something there, it's not the same nothing that like philosophers yeah. would talk about. Even though, in some sense, it may well be. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, as you know, philosophers got mad at me because and still are, oh, yeah, uh, because I, I made a joke about them in that book, where I said that, you know, I talked about enough of this, and I said philosophers and theologians would get, would, you know, would, would be mad because they're experts at nothing. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and see, now I, have I to just thought it was a good excuse for a joke. Because uh, when it comes to philosophy and science, I go both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching. There's, there's this... Well, I, I don't want to skip ahead to the question no, I wanted to do no. after this, but on, on this idea, when there is something so incredibly foreign to the people who haven't bothered to sure. that it almost sounds indistinguishable from, from the, the magical metaphysical stuff that... Yeah, and you know, I think Arthur C. Clarke said that once, that a sufficiently advanced civilization, would everything they do would seem like magic. Be careful, because now you're putting yourself in an impressively advanced civilization and me not in that civilization. What, what, so. No, but you know, and, it, and one of the things that, that I didn't talk about here, although you've heard me talk about it and it's in the book, is this notion from Plato that, that I talk, begin the book with that, that Plato imagined us being in a cave that looked at this wall, could only see the shadows of reality. I'm not going to go into the whole thing here. Right. But he did say that if you were dragged out and saw the light and saw the real world and tried to come back and explain it, people would think you're crazy. And it is a fundamental problem that the realm of the universe that, that, that I deal with on a, in my research, at least on a daily basis, is so far removed from human experience as to seem unintelligible and also impenetrable. And I think that's one of the reasons I try, well, that's one of the reasons I write books, but that's one of the reasons I told this story. And it's a longer story than my, my publishers wanted me to tell, because I think if you can show how we did it in baby steps, to get, you know, start with the, the things we measure, electricity and magnetism, and show by a series of steps how we get so far, then it seems less like magic. Because it was really human activity with a lot of little baby steps, which is what the other thing that science is normally not portrayed to be. It's all these scientific revolutions, but it's not. It's little baby steps done by individuals, often wrong, and, and, and you, can, you can get imperceptibly from here to there. It's like, you, you and I were just with Richard this week, Richard Dawkins this weekend, and, and it's like, as he often says about about evolution, you know, there, there's speciation, species change, but every every animal is the same species as its parent, but but by imperceptible changes, you go you go from one species to another, but at every instant, it, it you don't see the change, but eventually you make such a change that that a, that a, that one species is unrecognizable to the other. At least they don't have sex with it anymore. Uh, so <laughs> let me see if I can actually uh, stick a bow on. Sorry. Someone objected to some, yeah. <laughs> Someone's objecting to interspecies sex. I think. Okay. I'm fine with it if you can actually find a way to get consensus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so I'm going to put a bow on this because while I, I frequently said I don't claim to have any expertise in anything, and if I'm good at anything, it's taking complex ideas and distilling them down so everybody can understand because that's what I have to do for me to understand it. There are things that you say mm -hmm. that I do not believe not because I am convinced you're wrong, but because I don't understand them sufficiently to say that I believe them. Well, here's your first problem. You should never use the word believe. Ah, but no, so never use the word believe. No, 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 no. So I, at least a scientist should never use the word believe because things are either likely or unlikely. And that's it. We don't believe anything. I certainly don't believe anything. Are you convinced that something's likely? 
No, I have to be convinced of something, likely by right. the evidence. By belief, I be belief is the state of being convinced that something is likely. Well, if you want to call that, but I think, and, but the, and I think you're right in a general sense, but I have a problem with using words that have a lot of emotional baggage associated with them. Me too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I'm okay with belief because I think we can make a good case for using it, that there's a distinction between I am convinced this is the case, which is a fine okay. way to say it. You don't have to say belief. But if you're consistent about using the word belief... Okay. I'll buy that. I, I just think it's fine as I'm long as... I'm another debate. I'm yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually, I was going to point out it's okay as long as scientists don't use the word. Yeah. I mean, I you know, heathens things. like you, you could know. I mean, I mean, <laughs> philosophy heathens. Like yeah, me. philosophy heathens. No, but I think it's important. And scientists can use the word in a popular context, but never in the context of the song. Uh, and it's taken me a long time. I still put, sometimes do it, you know. Uh, but, but it's really important that we point out the belief, at least in science, that religious sense of belief, the faith in things unseen yes. and unmeasured, is, is not really there. Now, even that, of course, is not 100% true, because if you're a theoretical physicist or an experimental physicist working 25 years on an idea, you have some faith that it might be true, or you wouldn't be able to spend. But hold on, but but there's a fundamental difference in that sense that the faith is eminently shakable. That's the great thing about science, is because the minute you have that idea and you've worked on it for 20 years and you find out it's not true, you just throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. You don't hang on to it and cut heads off or anything like that. So faith is a word that I actually don't use. Ah, excellent. Well, I don't either, but I wanted to point out that, that in some sense you need to have some, you can call it intuition. Oh, but, I can go, I, okay. Yeah. So, faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, you just give a good reason. Well, yeah, but the problem, And, yeah. and okay. so, what, what... We rationalize our reasons. So reason is a slave of passion. And so, we all rationalize things we do. And we say, boy, you know, we have a good reason for doing that. And then afterwards, we realize we're wrong. Oh, yeah, I, I and, absolutely and, agree. And, and, and so, but, the, but what I mean is, even in science, we do that. I don't want to pretend that science isn't a human activity. That's why I said it. So some of those scientists were driven by their, the passion in the wrong direction. So what he is trying to do is pretend that we all have faith. Scientists have faith, and they have faith. Because what they're saying is we are convinced of things in the absence of absolute certainty, and that's what they want faith to yeah. be. Yeah, yeah. The problem is the things they are convinced of in the absence of absolute certainty, they have no good reason for. And the things that scientists are convinced of in the absence of absolute certainty, they have very good reasons to. And so what I instead I say I don't have faith in anything. I have reasonable confidence in things based on previous experience and evidence. So I in the same way that likely you or right, unlikely. Yes. I don't use the faith word. Yes, I fight against it. I'm okay with the belief word as long as we define it specifically as I'm convinced of something. Okay, so that's a great semantic discussion. <laughs> I'll call it a tie. <laughs> but that, that leads to another question. I'm constantly asked from skeptics and people who are concerned about how to do critical thinking and skepticism. I can't possibly have the time to become an expert in everything, which experts do I trust, which journals do I trust, all these other things. And for me, a lot of it comes down to the fundamentals of education. How do you think we can go about, best go about, the people in this room and outside of it, begin to fix the fear of scientific education, the, the lack of respect for it? Getting people to recognize that the fact that scientific findings change as we learn more is a good thing and not a bad thing. Yes, yes. How do we... Start working towards fixing that. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 there's a lot we need to do. And what first we can do, the way we fix it is by not teaching science badly. Uh, and I mean by that that I, that, that I think science certainly is taught incorrectly, at least it was when I, I, I was going to school, and I think still too much. In the same sense that all, I think all of our schools are, are outdated in the way we teach things. We teach things as if the information that a teacher is telling you matters. And it doesn't. You know, you get, you, get, you get the information, more information from this. What you need is the process, that you get more misinformation. Okay? And you need the process to distinguish between the two. And what you do is you take, the reason people are afraid of science is because, first of all, it's taught like, you know, Einstein saith, you know, and it's just like the Bible. But instead, we need to teach it as a process of discovery. Instead of teaching facts, we ask questions. And everyone loves the process of discovery. So teachers say, you know, let, how, how, how does this work? Let's figure it out. 
It becomes a puzzle-solving process. It becomes something that everyone naturally enjoys. And we see that the scientific enterprise is not a set of facts, but it's a process for deriving facts. And it's that process that matters, not the facts. And then, once you, have, once you learn that process, there aren't alternative facts anymore. Because, because the process is there. And I think, I think uh, that's really an essential part. And you need to have people be comfortable enough to teach that process. And part of that means it, being able to say, I don't know. Which is, which I know we've talked well, about. There's this fear of, I don't know, how many people were in school and you were terrified of being called to the blackboard or given an answer yeah. because you don't know. And one of the things I think we need to change is, is getting rid of that fear in children of the I don't know answer because quite often it's, it's the correct one. And we should applaud that and encourage this spirit of discovery and acknowledgement that I don't have an answer. And, and you know what, who's more afraid than children of the I don't know? Teachers and parents. Mm -hmm. Because how many parents when your kid asks you a question, you, you'll want to give an answer. You know, I like that Calvin and Hobbes thing where his father was giving a crazy answer. But, but uh, I had fun to do sometimes. But now uh, it's someone else's kids. But, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, it's re I think most, a teacher, when a student asks a question, doesn't want to say, you know, I don't know. But that's the best thing a teacher can say. And then follow it up with, hey, let's figure out maybe how we can find the answer together. And it'd be a process of joint discovery. And parents, again, I don't know. Be, be, be comfortable with saying I don't know because you don't. And that's a one. And not knowing is one of the one of the most exciting things about being human because it means there's something left to learn. And I, I have often said that, it, that as a theoretical physicist, um, the two most exciting states to be in are either wrong or confused. Because <laughs> really, because that means there's something that there's something interesting going on. This is. Especially intriguing for me because I mean we've interacted a few times. We probably haven't spent as much time together as we have in the last day or so. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I'm, I know that he doesn't have time to watch all of, or probably any of my stuff. And when I'm off, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm I've no idea what's going on. The same is true in reverse. But I don't have kids, but people will call into the atheist experience and say, "Oh, what should I do about kids and my friends' kids and everything else?" And I, what I encourage them to do is, when your kids ask you something you don't know, say, "I don't know." But let's go find out. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. Encourage that spirit of discovery. So you kind of leverage something in your talk when I said before that you know I, I don't believe you or I'm not convinced mm -hmm. because I don't have I don't have a sufficient understanding. Mm -hmm. I liken that to the fact that uh, Maxwell's work was required to give Einstein the tools, mm -hmm. to give Feynman the tools. Okay. To if somebody had tried to go back to Maxwell with this idea, the things that you're talking about. It would have been indistinguishable from religion, from, from, almost. From religion, probably, or certainly from magic. Yeah, magic. Um, which I know you do, and I've seen you do very yeah. well. Um, but uh, he's a good magician. I think he just did some card tricks for me before. I'm sure we could just forget this, and you could come out and do some magic. But, um, yeah, but, but it works both ways. I think it's really important to realize how there's that building process that, that uh, you know, I, that no knowledge has ever come from revelation. Not one iota of knowledge about it in human history has ever come from revelation. Einstein didn't have revelations. Einstein, you know, required the results of Faraday and Maxwell and then other experiments. And it, it, it always happens. There's no, there's no one, if you locked physicists in a room for 50 years and, and asked them to come up with a theory of the universe, what they can come up with would be totally, would be, first of all, far more boring than the real universe, but most certainly wrong. And it, it because, Revelation doesn't reveal anything. Now, you can re reflection reveals things. You can take knowledge, reflect upon it, and maybe get wisdom, but, or something like it, or get insights about yourself. But just thinking, pure thought, just sitting there and going, "Om," oh, does not yield revelation. And sorry, Sam Harris and other and other Buddhists. But anyway, <laughs> here's another area where, where we echoed each other, and some of you have heard me say this, and I heard you say something very similar yesterday. Uh, that's this idea that people who claim that they've got a revelation from God, or let's say they didn't even get a direct revelation from God, but they think that their holy book revealed something. It provides no substance until it's verified, which means even if there wasn't God who was revealing things to you, you would have no way of knowing. It doesn't become knowledge. It doesn't become accurate until you actually put it to the test. So, and this is where I'm in agreement with what Jerry Coyne said yesterday, mm -hmm. which is, Science may in fact be the only way of knowing. Oh, it's, I get rid of the may. 
Well, and by science, and it's really important to point out what science, and Jerry and I have the same definition of science, which is, for me, science is just empirical investigation combined with reason. That's science. Basic, it, investigating things based on testing, empirical evidence, retesting, and using logical analysis to, to analyze those results. That's science. So, so for me, science is very broad. And, and for some people, that might encompass other areas. But that's the process by which we Learn, we learn things about the universe, which I, which I call knowing, and and it's a, and even this learning about yourself is still doing that same thing, right? You're you're still asking questions and testing when you try and learn about yourself. You're not just closing your eyes. You're asking, well, you know, why did I do that yesterday? Am I really do I really crave that kind of attention all the time? And, <laughs> and anyway, yeah. I was at lunch and we were joking earlier because uh, yesterday at the Imagine Religion Seven conference. Uh, we, just, we decided we didn't want to do anything repeat, and I was up directly before, and so I did a magic show instead. And there were a number of issues and comments, uh, and now I've completely forgotten where I was going with that story. <laughs> it was good, though. I was enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want, like, a 50 cent refund for that, <laughs> um, talk to Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I've heard you say before, or I think I've heard you say before, in response to questions that are posed, particularly some that fall into the realm of philosophy, mm -hmm. that you find some of them uninteresting. Well, look, you know, I, I always get a, 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 look. Philosophy is useful. Philosophy is, is not. Philosophy is useful. Philosophy is reflection. Critical is questioning, reflecting, and it's reflecting on knowledge usually, and and then coming up with good questions. So philosophy is useful in those areas of human activity where the questions aren't yet well defined, because philosophy provides us a good tool to come up with good questions. And that, therefore, there's er, uh, my friend Dan Dennett is a, is, a, is a philosopher who deals with the brain. And, there's, and the brain consciousness is an area where really we don't understand anything very much. The proof, why well, you can tell how much we understand in a scientific field by how many books are written about it. If there are a lot of books, that means we don't understand much. And, um, because you know, there's, you only need one book on quantum mechanics, and, and that's it. But um, but but uh, but anyway, you, so in brain science, there's a lot of questions, and and you can actually drive forward research in neuroscience and, and psychology and uh, with with philosophical questions. And that that was true when natural philosophy was natural philosophy and physics. But physics has, has gone to the point where where the real questions aren't asked by philosophers because it's so much so much down the road that the real questions require an intimate knowledge of the physics to be able to ask the kind of right questions. And, and philosophers of physics, of which there are some, and I know I'll get in trouble because I do what I say, they, they ask the interesting questions themselves, but it has no impact on the physics. Zero. Because most physicists can't spell philosophy. Okay? And, and, and it, I have to say, in certain areas of the, the philosophy of science, it has very little in, impact on the other philosophers. It's a field where they talk to each other. Now, they do interesting, they're very interesting sets of reasoning and thinking. But I can tell you as a fact that, the phys that there's nothing that's come out of the philosophy of science in the last, certainly since I've been a physicist, that's impacted on physicists. And that, you know, and, and that, that's not, a, that's not a, a judgment. That's not a value judgment. It's just a fact. The physicists don't read the philosophical literature. And well, um, I don't read it. I mean, no, nothing's come up. No, no, no. I'm not saying it's by, by coming out of it. I mean, it's, I mean, influencing. By what I mean by that is influencing the work that's being done. And 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 even my my learning, what I know about philosophy of science. Of course, I read Kuhn and other people. But but more, I learned much more about the philosophy of science by my mentors who are scientists, from Feynman and other people. I learned much more about the way science is done, how questioning is done, and the kind of questions that might be fruitful. I've learned by the people. By the scientists who taught me, not by my philosophers. And, and you know, if we start to merge those two, you get to things like Karl Popper and the idea yeah. of falsification. But that doesn't exist without him, in the same way that Einstein doesn't exist without Maxwell. Yeah, no, look, look, there's a, look, I don't want, and that's the point. There's a rich human intellectual history, and, and, and it's all part of the wonderful uh, tapestry of being human, and that's what I was saying earlier. So I don't think that, that philosophy is uninteresting un to read. I, I read, I read, 
you know, I read the Bible too. I mean, it's all part of it's all part of. No, I don't want to put them in the same sense that way. But I mean, <laughs> but, but but you know, it's true that science has grown out of philosophy, but science has also grown out of religion. And so some people just mean to say, well, how can how dare you talk the way you were because the early scientists were all religious. Newton was religious, and and and, and the first thing is that well, that's because. The church was the National Science Foundation in the 16th century. I mean, you could there was no universities except church-supported universities, so it's not too surprising there was that religious connection. But more importantly, big deal. Yeah. I mean, children grow up, so science grew out of out of religion and to some extent philosophy, but it's grown up. And sadly, children cast aside the things their parents taught taught them and, or made them think about, and they become adults. And so. It's absolutely true that science owes religion, in some sense, uh, a debt, historical debt, but it's an ancient one, and we just just throw, you know, it's just bury it down. This isn't the path that I, I intended to. Good, I, 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 I love it. Yeah, good. Uh, That's when it's best. Well, I remember a call to the show one time where I said something, and, and somebody asked, "Well, Isaac Newton believes in God. Do you think you're smarter than Isaac Newton?" And I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of God and perhaps alchemy. I know a lot more about the we, 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 we know a lot more than Newton, absolutely. I am smarter because of Newton. That yeah. doesn't mean I'm more brilliant or more insightful or I'm likely to change the world in the way he did. But colloquially speaking, yeah, I'm smarter than Newton on God. What, what kind of statement would it be about the world if we hadn't gotten any smarter yeah. in the intervening years? And Newton, by the way, and I talk about Newton in the new book, but Newton was crazy. He, was, he, would, he would not, he would be hospitalized now. There's no doubt about that. He was really a crazy man. But he also was a basically full-time, not just alchemist, he spent much more time on the Bible than he did on physics. I mean, he's, he was convinced that there were secret messages in the Bible that only he understood. He was really a full-time theologian and a, and a part-time physicist. And I've often said if he spent more time as a physicist, he might have made a name for himself. <laughs> now, I, I'm somebody who actually does, I, I'm a huge fan of Denver, and hopefully I'll be on stage with him one day because we communicated by email. Oh, specifically about the free will issue, which I'm not going to go into. Yeah. Uh, there was a big. I You're free not to. I was the lone compatibilist at INR5 standing up having an argument against uh, Krista Carlo and Jerry Coyne and Richard Dark. I'm like, Bill, how does that happen? How weird is my life that I end up defending that? Uh, but I, I do find some of the questions um, interesting. And I have Dennis talk about intuition bumps, and, and everybody loves various thought experiments. Uh, I was talking to actually my friend Lee the other day about the problem of the ship of Theseus and how it relates to identity. You know, how many parts of the ship can change before it's different. The Star Trek transporters, which my wife, when we go to the happy hour, if the I, if the concept of identity comes up, she knows there's going to be a discussion about whether or not you step in a transporter. Are you committing suicide? <laughs> this is why we, she doesn't go to happy hour with me anymore. <laughs> It's a conversation, I kid you not, that came up week after week. It's like the only thing that geeky atheists want to talk about. <laughs> so I can understand why people are like, Where did you first start thinking about that? What's that? When did you first think about the Star Trek fan point? Um, so... <laughs> no, it's all right. My friend gave me this book called This is Star Trek. <laughs> No, I, I knew nothing about the author. I would have never imagined reading the book that he'd be sitting up here with me today. Um, but throughout some, some philosophical discussions, I find it interesting because primarily when I, when I do philosophy, I'm, a, I'm more focused on the thought experiments, the, th the things that make people think. I love to make people think. I love to confound expectations. It's one of the reasons why I love doing magic. It's one of the reasons I do things like this. I mean, we agree on a lot. We're not going to agree on anything. If I talk to people who I agree with on everything, I would never learn anything. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even be able to learn that they're wrong or how I can understand that they're wrong without engaging. Now I'm not in it like you stress saying that you should spend your time engaging with people who you think are wrong over and over and over again, because I like my show and I don't want you to take it over. <laughs> you get to decide what conversations you need you want to have and how you have them. And the advice that I gave yesterday, uh, briefly was Listen charitably. As charitably as possible. That doesn't mean you should be a doormat for people to walk on. Um, try not to pretend like you can read minds, like you can tell what their motivation is. Oh, you're only saying this because, in the same way that somebody does, you know, oh, you're an atheist because you, you were mad at God. 
No, I'm not. I wasn't any more mad at God than I was at Voldemort. <laughs> so don't pretend like you can read motivation. Ask lots of questions. And the one thing is, you don't owe anybody an explanation or an argument. And so if people are pushing at you and you're no longer comfortable with it, you get to stop it. And you also get to say something that I love to say, which is, that's an interesting point. Let me think about it and get back to you. And then think about it and get back to them because you need to do what you're saying to them. For me, philosophy is primarily about my, my fundamental love of philosophy comes from issues surrounding epistemology. How do we know what we know? How do we, what, are, what are the foundations of logical reasoning and, and what can we learn from those? The, the most recent video I put up, I don't know how many people are familiar, I do the Atheist Debate Patreon Project which I post in my debates, reviews in my debates. I talk about the argument of the existence of God. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I try, to, I try to go into things in pretty good detail. So it's not just, here's the teleological arguments in short form. Uh, for example, the video on Pascal's wager is like 35 minutes long, and I go into great detail to talk about what Pascal actually said and how modern just theists and Christians get it wrong. And one of the most recent videos that I posted uh, in the last week, I think, uh, it's called the, the Beautiful and Ugly Truth, in quotes, about logical syllogisms. Because we get so focused on this idea of truth, which within philosophy there's disagreement about whether we have access to truth at all, when really, if you have a syllogism that's constructed in such a way that it's valid, we know that two premises that lead to a true conclusion. But the truth is irrelevant in, the, in, in, the, in argumentation. If you are convinced that the premises are true and you reject the conclusion, you are by definition irrational, even if they weren't true, because you're now in conflict with yourself and you're in conflict with reason. Trying to establish a reasonable world is in part about internal consistency so your worldview doesn't fall apart. But the goal, which is why I ended up on a future, I want to believe as many true things and as true false things as possible, is for my internal model of the world to match the external model as best it can. And I think science is the only way of knowing that you have that model. And philosophy is the background tools that allows us to make use of science and reason about it such that we can confirm the reliability of what we're finding from science. Yeah, I mean, it's one way. I think that's, but I, I mean, and then, you know, scientists are doing philosophy, which I keep getting wrong about, it's fine. But that's what scientists are doing. They're confirming the reliability. They're using the tools of philosophy, if you wish, as practicing scientists, because they're continuing to, to do that. And, and the point is, which I wrote about in one of my books, but it, it's, it's that there is no such thing as scientific truth. Right. It, 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 science is an approximation of reality, and it's always an approximation. And it describes the, all scientific theories, even quantum electrodynamics, that greatest theory we have, only works over a certain region. And so we have to realize that, that whenever we're saying things, we are we are... We, we don't capture the whole truth, and that's fine. And, it's, and, and it, what we progress is a little bit at a time. And as Feynman said, you know, maybe you know, it's like an onion, you know, you peel back. There's, there might never be a theory of everything. In fact, I'm quite skeptical of that. That's okay, because we'll learn a little bit more tomorrow than we did today, and we'll be a little less falsehood on your t-shirt, and a little more things that are not false, which is what really science could tell, not that it's true, but just that it's not false. And, and, and I do, I want to, when you're talking, I want to comment about one thing, because I really like your, the three ways of sort of discussing that you described. And, and what I want to relate to people who may not know this is, is they were epitomized by one of my favorite people who's passed away, Christopher Hitchens, who was a friend of mine. But what people don't realize, because Christopher seemed like a bulldog on stage, was that, and he was, um, is that he was one of the most tolerant people of listening to others uh, in life that I, I know. I mean, he would regular have, regularly have dinner parties with people that I would have a hard time being in the same room with. I mean, you know, Scalia was a regular, a regular guest of Christopher's at his house. And you, can you imagine? Could you have in any way? And, and, but he would love to, he loved to be able to be, you know, be, not have an echo chamber. Be able to talk to people about things that, that and, and he and I had many debates about Iraq, for example, where we, we disagreed. It's one, of, one, of, one of the two things that I disagree with him about, that and the wisdom of drinking scotch while debating, but he was far, far better at it than I was. I want to tell you, um, can I say this? Yeah, I can. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to give the 
that when he had his memorial service, uh, they asked his wife asked me to, to give the, the speech, and, and and then there was a lot of other minor figures like Salmon Rushdie and Tom Stoppard, and, <laughs> and, and, and Sean Penn. And, and now um, I'm going to talk about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Anyway, so I was I I turned to Salmon Rushdie and said next to me, I said, "We were going to this program and say, who the hell is Lawrence Krauss?" But anyway, but but what's interesting is that the old the, my favorite speech was by another friend of mine who, who I just was with in England, Stephen Fry. Who's wonderful, you know, Stephen Fry. And, 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 yeah, he's great. <laughs> but Stephen said what he disagreed with. <laughs> Who's Christopher about? He said Christopher once wrote that there are four, the four most overrated things in the world, and I, I think I have them right. Were, were picnics, <laughs> the champagne, strawberries, and anal sex. <laughs> and, and, and what Stephen said is, I, I agree with him about three of those. <laughs> So, we want to make sure we get to your questions, which is always the thing that's most interesting for you, usually. Always, always, usually? Always, usually. I need to stop that's that's that a philosophical question. You've got questions, watch your ass up with the microphone. Is there microphones? Yeah. The microphone at the end of each aisle, we have a house place below so we can see people's faces. Um, I, well, I'm not even going to add anything. I don't want to take any time on any of your questions. We'll, we'll sum up at the end, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Oh, you need to actually like get right up next to the mic. I think it's on. Oh, I hear it. I hear it here anyway. Okay. Um, waves. So we can see waves at different scales: sound waves, mm -hmm. uh, water waves, electromagnetic waves, uh -huh. gravitational waves. Um, <clears throat> to what extent is that just a superficial? Are they superficially analogous, or is there some? Oh, is this a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a really good question. Waves are, are natural because, um, in physics, because the, really what I said about copying really works. The great thing about physics is very few ideas w are needed to describe many different things. And basically, every time you have what's called a restoring force, so things are in equilibrium, like that. Um, thankfully, that was restored. But, but uh, uh, every time you have a restoring force, so that the situation is such that when you depart from it, there's something that wants to bring it back. You produce oscillations, and and those oscill so the same equation, which is called the wave equation, works ubiquitously throughout the, world, the universe for many different phenomena. You you pluck space a little bit in general relativity, which means I wave my hands because my my hands bend space. So when I move them around, I'm bending space in a disturbing way. It creates a ripple that is like a pond, like a ripple on a pond. And so, and similarly, I shake an electric charge, and I, and I, and I, and that changing, that changing magnetic field creates a disturbance that ripples out. And it's the same, the wave equation is ubiquitous simply because in nature there's a restoring force, basically. So that's why it applies over so many different neat ranges of human activity. Good. That's a good question. Yeah? I have a question about uh, ethics and science. Um, Lawrence, you talked about how the scientific method mitigates against scientists' own prejudices and biases. Yeah. But how does it work with you know guys who, who, who love the physics so much that they created the the atom bomb? Um, oh. How do how do we how does science uh, sort yeah. itself out when it comes to you know just because we can do something should we and, and how does the scientific method deal with, you know, un unethical science things like animals or like treatment of animals well, or creation yeah. of terrible things? I'll, I'll start, and you probably have some uh, comments as well from, from a, maybe a slightly different perspective. But the, the, the science, what determines what should be done in some sense, scientists will pursue with three questions. And, the, but, but, Every, everything we do as humans can have good and bad consequences. Steve, uh, Steve Pinker, uh, another friend of mine, said, uh, said very beautifully, I think. You know, people always say, oh yeah, people, scientists will be, will be an atom bomb. Um, but of course, atomic energy is incredibly also useful. Um, and and we, have, we get our nuclear reactors which don't produce carbon in the atmosphere uh, if they're designed correctly and don't, don't do bad things, um, which they can do. Uh, but, but they don't point out that that's true about everything. Architects can create beautiful buildings, but they can design gas chambers. Um, and so 
what, ne what we need to do is realize that, that those are societal questions that society has to decide at some level, but only an informed society, only people who are informed of the issues and the perspective of science can then make a judgment. But, it, but scientists should not be ultimately making the decisions about how society uses the products of science. In a democracy, that should be people and our elected representatives, but those people and elected representatives need to have some scientific literacy at some level to make sensible decisions. But I don't think, but the, sci you know, but the scientists are gonna discover principles that can produce wonderful things and awful things. And it's just the way it is, and it's the way it's always gonna be. And to, and to, and to put your head in the sand and not think in advance about the awful possible things that can happen. Be it for, take CRISPR technology, which is a, an amazing technology that's used now to manipulate DNA in a way that would have been impossible 10 years ago, which, is, which could be, do wonderful things for solving, to, curing diseases. But it also makes hacking incredibly easy. And it makes the possibility of creating smallpox viruses, for example, in simple laboratories, possible. And so it, we need to recognize those, those we need to, as Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors a prepared mind. So I think we need scientists owe it to the public to explain what's happening and the possible implications of what might happen. And it's up to, in my opinion, the public to decide then how to create institutions and encourage the scientists to create institutions that help ensure that the, 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 the products that come out of science have the best possible effect for humanity. But but to pretend that these things aren't going to happen just because we don't like them, um, or pretend that they don't exist because we don't like them. As a Catholic Church, I mean, to bring it back to them, in vitro fertilization, which, you know, was condemned because the, 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 the babies that would come out wouldn't have a soul, right? And so they came out, they were the same as everyone else, and then that, that stopped. But all those things are going to happen. Cloning people is going to happen, in my opinion, at some point. These things are going to happen because they're possible. But it's the scientific community, this, where scientific ethics comes in, is honesty, and full disclosure, transparency, non-authoritarianism. Those are the ethics of science. That's what makes good science. And when, when scientists are unethical, it's, it's we're violating one of those things. But if they're, if they're honestly doing work, they're disclosing it, they're communicating with others, and, and, they're, and they're willing to not <coughs> censor information, then at some level, that's, that's healthy science, and ultimately it's society that's got to survive, decide what, which areas of science to fund and not. I don't know if you want to add to that. I, I'm largely in agreement. There's maybe a slightly different way of phrasing the same thing, because I don't put the foundation of morality on societal opinions. But I do think that we, we evaluate the consequences of our actions. And you're not even the person to ask yet. I'm going to look at you. No. <laughs> we evaluate the consequences of our actions with respect to some goal. You can't know what the consequences of some scientific discoveries are going to be. And so when you talk about ethics in science and scientific uh, investigation, and there are two things to consider. Is the process demonstrably immoral? Are we chopping up people left and right in order to understand things better? We already know that that's wrong. So if there's no demonstration that the fundamentals of the process are immoral, we won't. Then the next thing is to evaluate the consequences of what we discover. And you can't really know what the consequences are until you actually discover it. We could clone a person tomorrow, and we could find out that this is a really big deal, and we, we develop a better understanding of what is or isn't immoral about it, and we stop it. Or we can clone somebody tomorrow and find out that the things that we were afraid of aren't real. I don't know that there, if, as long as the process isn't immoral, I don't know that you could possibly say that any sort of discovery of a truth about the universe is itself immoral or so dangerous, you have to be able to, to fund that discovery to know what the danger is going to be. Yeah, I think, and, and, and that's why, I mean, that's why one of the reasons I'm happy I'm a physicist, because, and my lovely mother, who's in the audience, wanted me to be a doctor, um, and, and uh, she got over it eventually, but it took a long time. Um, but, but, uh, um, but happily, there are, and when it comes to biology, there are many more immediate more sort of ethical or moral questions. And the obvious ones, experimentation on human patients is universally uh, agreed to be, you know, immoral, you know. And, but the good deal about, that's why I love what I do as a scientist. 
because what I do has no practical significance whatsoever. <laughs> okay, this won't be nearly as deep. This is going back to high school oh, physics. Good. It's getting really deep. Bugged in for 30 years now. Oh. Why is the universe right-handed? Was torque? It's actually left-handed. Is it left-handed? Why is the universe left-handed? When you apply <laughs> torque in an XY plane, force. In the oh, 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 that's, oh, oh, that's field oh, in an oh, electric field that goes um, plane, oh, plane. oh, I see. Oh, okay, I, you have to ask a different question I thought you were asking. Oh, that's just, an, that's just semantics. No, 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 no. I mean, because we, we have what's called the left-handed rule, right-handed rule in electromagnetism. So magnetic field goes around here, and you, or the electron, you know, the current goes like this, the magnetic field goes like that. Why is it that way? That's just because we define it to be that way. If we change the sign of the charge, it'd be that way. So we just, it's just an arbitrary. Well, why don't we make it at all? If it's X, y, oh, why is it in that? Why is it? What, what just kicks it out? The other oh, that's, that is just the way it works. I mean, no, that's just it. That's, that's right. That, 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 the fact that, that, that a magnetic, that, 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 a, that a magnetic field causes a force on a moving electron that's perpendicular to its motion is an amazing discovery. An Actually, amazing I know discovery. The answer. Because of the Higgs field, but we won't yeah. be able to know that and prove me right for another. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but what I but I thought the question you're asking, which is even deeper. So, so that is just that's just convention. If you are on Mars and you call the electron positive instead of negative, they'd be using the left-handed rule instead of the right-handed rule. So that's just convention of naming. There's nothing fundamental about it. It's just the way we define directions. It's just words. But more significant is the fact that there are particles in nature, like the neutrino, that spin. And we call them left-handed if they're moving and they're spinning that way. We call them right-handed if they're moving and they're spinning that way. Well, it turns out in nature, they're only left-handed neutrinos. Yeah, and, the answer, you and, you know yeah. the, and you know the answer to that? No. <laughs> I wanted to know the answer to that because we share that, because no one knows. And that's the exciting thing. We don't have the slightest idea why neutrinos are only left-handed. We think we've got a lot of ideas of why, and it may be related to why the universe is made of matter, not antimatter. It, but, but we don't know yet, and we're going to try and find out. So it's about you for 30 years, and nobody else knows Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You, you can go. Can you? Okay, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you so much for being here tonight. On behalf of everyone in this room. Oh, thank you. Uh, I guess couched in my question is an assumption you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Bob Duco is a Christian apologist out of Detroit. He is like, you know, sort of like, oh my gosh, I've sat down with those the most brilliant people like Lawrence Cross, Dr. Cross is that true? Number one. Number two. Uh, Matt, did you, I know Aaron has had a discussion with um, that apologist. Uh, would you do the same? Uh, so first oh. question, have, have you, in fact, sat down with Bob Ducco or... No, I generally don't. with him, he, well, he and, and we, all we, the time that he has chat, chatted with you in the early mind, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, he's chatted with me, but he's never chatted with me directly, and he won't. Um, because uh, I don't... It, I and it'd be interesting because we have different views about that because well Matt is, fulfills an important role but I don't I generally I have debated as in fact in Toronto I recently was snookered into a debate with the idiot from the Discovery Institute a year ago <laughs> but but uh, but um, but I generally don't do it because I don't first of all I find debates to be formal debates to be rhetorical devices not devices for education so generally I don't like I, I'll do dialogues I'll do discussions but. Most often, there are people who want to appear on stage. It's the same reason I won't debate UFO uh, apologists on stage. Because they want to be on stage, So, because then it gives them validity. It makes it seem like I take them seriously. And more importantly, you know, it, it, the audience assumes that two people are honest and they both sound reasonable, and therefore it's he said, she said, or whatever. And what it does is it gives the illusion of equality when it does, that's why I won't ever debate evolution versus intelligent design because it makes it sound like there's a debate to be had. There's no debate to be had. I mean, there's no debate. To be had. So I have no 
I do, you're talking about, because despite what people think, I don't follow every apologist on the planet. <laughs> uh, if, he's, I, on a, he's on a presuppositional apologist, like your best friend, Ty. Well, he's off to a good start. <laughs> uh, not a really good start, but a, a, a better start than some people have made. Um, we're, we're not far apart in our view of the business, yeah. but, but we're a little bit. Um, well, Aaron Roth was interviewed, and they had an hour conversation. I'm surprised you, maybe you should, it was very interesting. I'll ask Aaron. Yeah, yeah, um, it, I mean, it was. On, on the debate thing, though, I'm largely happy to debate almost anybody. There are exceptions. There are people I've debated before who I won't debate again, uh, mostly because they some of them are terrible people, not because they're, they're terrible debaters. Yeah. Also, there are, are people who, who, I don't like the idea of, of, of peers, but if you get somebody who doesn't know anything, yeah. now all of a sudden in a debate, I have to backpedal so that it looks like I'm not being a dick. <laughs> and I don't do debates, at, I understand why he would do debates as primarily rhetorical devices, and I talk about debate as primarily theater. Yeah, because it's yeah. not necessarily the best argument. It's about presentation. It's about making sure. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, and I don't think I'm telling tales. And if I am, first you'll tell me. Uh, if you want to do a debate in a Baptist church, you don't want Richard Dawkins. You want me, because I have credibility with those people that he doesn't. Yeah. In the same way that if you were talking science, you don't you don't want me. You want Lawrence or, or Richard. Uh, I'm trying to fundamentally change the way debates are done, and I'm having some success at it. Because people, okay. he who shall not be named, <laughs> yeah, that's the way it should be. Is uh, is a skilled debater, probably one of the best debaters Christianity has. But he's formulaic, predictable, and he wants only PhDs to debate. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm sorry to all those people who are credentialed. I'm not just picking on you because I'm not. You can be overly educated in something, but you forget the basics. And so there's a there's a strategy to the debate where you get up and you say, in order for my opponent to win, they must do this, this, this. Yeah. It is the collegiate score debating format, and yeah. I couldn't give a rat's ass about that format because I want to have the conversation. And if you get people to break out of that format, where you have dialogues, where you have discussions, where you have debates that instead of 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. that are like joint press conferences, instead you say, Here's my position, here's my position, now let's go at it. That's a cross examination. Yeah. Those are the debates that I want to have. Because guess what? A lot of those guys who are debating are basically thinking from a script. And I get to push back on that script and expose are they just, is Sykes and Brutenkate just parroting what Greg Bonson said? Does he actually understand it at all? So I get to ask the questions that confound them. You know, when I was on uh, a radio station in Minneapolis, St. Paul, they invited me back because they wanted me to debate Ray Cummer. <laughs> Good and friend, I, Ray. I said, yes. Yeah, sure. He's a nice guy. He's, He's a real nice guy. guy. I really, I really Polluted, like but really nice guy. Uh, <laughs> Las Vegas. I saw that. that was yeah, well, well, we all saw it. it was Washington, Washington, where I was with, with the whole. Yeah, yeah, with Washington, D.C. Yeah. But he showed up and he wouldn't debate. And he basically just said, I'm not interested in demonstrating the existence of God. I'm just here because I love Matt and I don't want him to go to hell. Yeah. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody wastes my time. I get to waste as much of my damn time as I want, nobody else gets to waste any of it. And so people who knew this said, oh, did you feel like this was a complete waste of your time? No. Because I was on drive time Christian radio, yeah. with Christian parents driving their little exactly. Christian kids around, and they heard an atheist give all the good reasons why they shouldn't be believing what they believe, and their representative said, oh, I don't want to defend God, I just don't want Matt to go to hell. That was definitely not a waste of my time. And the radio station was completely irritated that Ray pulled this little bait and switch on debate. Now, I'll never debate him again because he doesn't want to debate. Uh, I don't know about that apologist, yes. that was way longer. But, but, you know, I think it's also useful that you, I mean, there are lots, thousands of different points of light. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah seriously, yes. No, I'm saying Travis. Yeah, okay, oh. Okay. <laughs> you saying it, we're done? Um, we, have, we have time for one more question. Okay, well, okay, then I won't say what I'm going to say. Is that all we have? Time for one more question. Two, two more questions is what we have. Okay, let's be quick. And, and as a reminder, and I, I apologize because I didn't Why know. is that? Okay, we were going to ramble. Maybe the theater's over here. You're selling books afterwards, right? Well, I'm not selling them, but I'm signing them. Okay, signing books. We'll be out there, we can visit, and I'll stand outside if you want. 
Uh, and, and by the way, yeah, I should say that because until they kick us out of the theater, um, out of the front, if we don't answer your questions here, I'll, and then and when I'm signing, I'll I, well, I'll stay here until the last person has a question. So I mean, we'll have to have fun. So my question is a little bit off of this topic, but it's kind of it kind of relates to some of the videos that you have on YouTube, Matt. I saw one debate that you had about whether or not humans have souls or not, and I think that you very much won that debate. The only question that I kind of have regarding that would be about near-death experiences, in particular out-of-body experiences, where someone is supposed to cons uh, be considered like flatlined, their brain dead, their brain is not supposed to be working, yet they report being able to see things happening around them, and even in other rooms they're able to report conversations and things like that, yep. and researchers have been kind of trying to say that this demonstrates that a soul exists. Um, I just yeah, they're kind wrong. Of they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can explain why. Explain why pretty quickly, so we can get on to the next question. When is it that they report yeah. this experience? It's after they've been revived. Now, so you've got a brain that's trying to make sense of what happened when it was not functioning, and you're also adding emphasis to the idea that a malfunctioning brain is going to give you more accurate information than a functioning one. <laughs> and when we put it to the test, for example, you could put a sheet of paper that you could only see from hovering way above the operating table, uh, and they've done these tests. Nobody reports what's on the paper. It's the, the idea of a soul is the single most dead concept in all of theology. And I'm going to do, I'll do a video in part that goes into this in, in more detail. Uh, but everything we know that, about what's attributed to the soul is an identifiable, malleable part of the brain. Yeah. To the point where even split brain patients, uh, D.S. Ramachandra, look him up, he does a great talk yeah. several years ago about yeah. split brain patients where they severed the corpus callosum. And you end up with two distinct personalities that communicate independently. One of them's a theist, one of them's an atheist. Go figure that out, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the physiology of seeing a tunnel, like in, in all these things, as the brain is shutting down, the idea that the, that, that the field of vision gets narrower and narrower. That everything that, that's been discussed is just, yeah. And, 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 and meanwhile, the, the, the just religious people want to that they see tends to coincide with what the religion is. Yeah. And so if there's no. different religions seeing this, they can't all be correct. They can all be incorrect. Well, you know, and Carl Sagan said this in a beautiful book, which he was famous before he died, the uh, candle, what was it, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Mm -hmm. dark. Um, he said, you know, it's interesting that people report now seeing angels. And, you know, in the 16th century, they saw fairies. And in the 15th century, and it's interesting that it's always a thing, or aliens. I mean, it's always the thing the, that you the see. Aliens. Yeah, because we, because somehow when people see these things, they're exactly what that culture is defined to see, but it's never constant. Anyway, we should, we should go back. Go back to the, last, the beginning of the century, and what people described as aliens is very different. And suddenly, around 2001, they all become the almond eyes, and yeah. the, the, the stories get more similar. And it tells us more about who we are and how we're influenced than it does about anything in some supernatural way. Yeah, yeah, it's fine to say it's more likely due to the known irrationality of humans than the unknown rationality of aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you get the last question. Yeah, which is a great question. Uh, right. No, no question. <laughs> Um, you should remember, we talked briefly about interesting and uninteresting questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it isn't, maybe it'll go better. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, Professor Krauss, uh, yeah. sorry, Matt, I rarely have asked for physicists to money schools I can call you next Sunday if I have anything yeah. to ask you. <laughs> um, there's something that I've always wondered about, and it has to do with the death of the universe. Uh -huh. um, I kind of get it, but I'm totally not a scientist, so I really don't. Um, okay. Does matter ever stop existing because the stuff that makes it up loses its energy? Do electrons deorbit? Does everything fall apart until there's nothing? Because I read the universe from nothing, and I'm wondering if we'll ever get back to that. Well, to where there's a new universe. Well, no, I talked about that in that book, but but uh, let me see. Well, clearly not, clearly not. But um, <laughs> um, I apologize. No, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a subtle and difficult concept. But, um, so, the point is that, that, as far as we know, electrons don't decay, okay? Um, protons, we think, may decay, although they decay in such a long time that, that you keep your diamonds, as I said. But, 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 um, but it turns out that there is a process that, that takes matter that we think and turns it into radiation. And it's black holes. 
And so eventually, it's quite likely that most of the matter in the universe will fall into black holes in the center of galaxies. And what is really weird, for reasons that is really strange, is black holes radiate. Stephen Hawking, that's what made him famous. And, and I mean, they, theoretically they radiate. We don't know for sure, because we've never seen one, okay? But if, when they do, whatever fell in, it becomes irrelevant. And, you know, two Volkswagens or one Cadillac, it doesn't matter. Um, what comes out is exactly the same, and it's radiation. And so in that, that, in that way, that sort of processes everything and, and, and turns it into radiation. And so the ultimate state of a universe in which matters, all the matters collapse in black holes will ultimately be a universe of just pure radiation. But the really neat thing is that it doesn't have to always be that way. Because if the universe is eternal, since, as I de demonstrated, nothing is unstable, and what I mean is, is that nothing is unstable. If, if you wait long enough, you'll produce stuff again. And so, in, a, in an eternal universe, you'll have quantum fluctuations that will eventually produce a lot of stuff again. And so, um, so in that sense, what, everything that was there will have disappeared, but other stuff can reappear. And, and so, you know, if that makes you feel better, great. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Hey, Vancouver, let's talk physics and more. I'll be at the uh, Vancouver Playhouse October 13th talking about my new book, The Edge of Knowledge, along with Travis Pagburn. And we'll talk about a lot more than just that. We'll talk about life, the universe, and everything. And we'll also maybe talk about uh, atheism a little bit. Uh, I notice I have my God detector, and I keep looking at it every day and notice there's still no God. So maybe we'll talk about that as well. But mostly I want to focus on the mysteries of the universe, and we'll have a Q&A so you can ask questions. And I hope to have a great time out there. See you October 13th at the Vancouver Playhouse. Take care.